Sorry all right. for all the spelling errors there. Okay, so um, Paul is... Uh, we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So there we go, that's me. I'm Paul, uh, VK1 Alpha Tango Papa. Um, licensed recently after Kim and, and Josh last year at um, Perth encouraged me to go for a licence uh, at the Open Radio Mini Conf. Um, got that in April, then upgraded to advanced in, in August. It's been a bit of fun. Um, so, yeah, what do you do with, what do you call an amateur radio transceiver? You know, I've chosen to define it as a collection of components that receives and transmits and covers one or more of the amateur bands in CW, AM or SSB, one of those. Anyone object to that definition? Yeah, at least one of, <laughs> plus extras, yeah. And, and what makes it open? So, you know, tap an open hardware license for the, the, the hardware bits, GPL software, and you want it for the schematics, the layouts and everything, or what? And you know, because of the state of things, I'm just saying, yeah, they try, because it's, it's difficult. So, what you can buy now? Uh, this is the, the main one, the Open HPSDR. It's a pretty serious kit. Um, it's a, a Tapper project. Uh, it's been around for a while now, I think, um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's all open, mm -hmm. so all the boards, parts, you know, schematics, and the software to run it is all open source. They have a few different designs. Um, you know, from 10 watts up to 100 and, and various uh, ADC capabilities. And you can actually buy them uh, through Apache Labs, uh, an Indian company. They're uh, pretty expensive and it requires uh, PC software to actually do anything useful. And that's what the commercial version looks like, which is, you know, a nice box as opposed to this thing. Next one is the Tentec, um Rebel, it's an open source QRP thing, they're about 200 bucks for a built unit. Um, yeah, 5 watts and CW only, so no good for folks like me who you don't understand Morse. Um, it is standalone and don't, don't need a PC for it. Uh, yeah, no license I could find, but they do provide schematics and layouts in uh, Eagle format, uh, and the fir firmware for the chipkit Arduino thingo is is uh, provided. So with that, the, the community has added some bits. So there's a frequency display. You can hook an LCD up to it and it shows you what frequency you're, you're on, which is not standard on this thing. Uh, auto gain control and things like that. And Tentec have uh, announced the Patriot, which is an SSB one, but I've not heard anything about that since the, the date in, in September. Uh, they merged with Alpha Amplifiers at the same time, and I think they might have just got swallowed up, and that's it. May not be anything more out of that. Uh, this is the SDR Cube. It's a bit of an older one, uh, I believe. Uh, it's a uh, single band with a soft rock internal. Uh, I'll talk about those in, in a bit. Um, yeah, reasonably cheap, but you know, low output. Um, it all is all open in, in various Tapper and, and other licenses. And yeah, standalone box. It seems to be a pretty cool idea. That's kind of it at the moment for what you can actually buy. You know, the next one you can buy, but it's a little bit different. And this is the future. Yes, yeah, the, the microcontroller SDR stuff. Um, you, you, know, you get a cheap uh, microcontroller, usually the STM32s these days which you can do a lot of SDR on, you know, on chip and not have to worry about you know, all the rest of the, the hard bits of, uh, of radio. And David Rowe's talking a lot more about that on Thursday, so go and see him. So this one is the MCHF, uh, Chris Monka out of um, uh, England, I think. Uh, it's fully open except for one bit, the layouts. So he, he's selling boards uh, to fund it. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, STM32 there with knobs on, so you don't need a PC for it. Five watts HF only. Uh, yeah, no lay layouts. So you, you can buy the boards, uh, and it's a kit. 
So you have to put it together and there's lots of even smaller SMD parts than you were building today. <laughs> About 150 bucks worth of components there. And yeah, it's, it's new and funky with the 3D printed enclosure, you know, which you can see there. You don't have to do the 3D printed one. There are, uh, I think there's CNC uh, router files for it as well, so you can make a metal one. And so, yeah, that is actually it for what I found that you can buy right now. That's it for open radios. There's a few coming soon, uh, except for OpenQRP, which I only discovered yesterday, so I haven't <laughs> researched that. Uh, I think it's a, it's a CW board again, uh, out of Canada, uh, QRP, obviously low, low power output. Uh, this is my favourite, the portable SDR. It's come out of the um, Hackaday Challenge. Uh, SDR, Software Defined Radio. The idea is you have uh, an analog to digital converter at your antenna and everything else is done in software. It's not quite like that, but that, that's the idea. Um, so, yeah, he, he built this for the uh, Hackaday Prize, got third place, and Sat Satnog's one, which is another pretty cool amateur project, um, satellite ground stations. Um, yeah, this one is 5 watts HF and 2 metres and it has a GPS uh, chip on it as well, so you can do APRS and, and other fun, fun things like that, uh, which is the Amateur Radio Packet Reporting System, I think it's what it stands for. Um, it's a 9600 board uh, modem over FM audio. It's a bit convoluted, but the hardware is cheap and easy. Um, yeah, it's designed to be tinkered with, so he's laid out the board in a sensible way so you can you know, put your probes in and do fun stuff and add on bits if you want to. Um, yeah, fully open in all of it, you can recreate it from, from the uh, bits he's given us. And uh, version 2 is nearly ready, um, and it again will be a, a kit with lots of tiny little parts. I mean, this board, um, yeah, it fits in the palm of your hand. It's, it's that small. Uh, there's the White Box project, uh, which is uh, Chris Tester and Bruce Perrins out of Algoram. Um, I think Chris is doing the work and Bruce is saying how awesome it is, uh, as Bruce likes to do. Um, yeah, SDR, it's a low power FPGA like thing, which I don't quite follow. I think it uses uh, static RAM instead of. DRAM, so it uses a lot less battery. Um, it's yeah, VHF, UHF only, fully open, but dual license uh, so that uh, Algorand can create appliances from it, I think is the idea. And it is more like a dev kit for an SDR than a, a transceiver, you know, a fully working amateur transceiver. So the idea is you, you build you know, the next version of the Baofeng uh, handheld out of it that can do whatever you like. Uh, yeah, I guess he's probably had an update in the ham radio now, uh, videos from the Tapper DCC, but I haven't watched them yet. Uh, there's the UDRX 440. It's a 25 watt, uh, 70 centimetre, uh, 433 megahertz and up. Um, $395. It was supposed to be released in Q4 last year, uh, but they didn't. I think it's getting close. They had some issues with the, the RF power amplifiers. Um, that's all you know, open firmware I could find, um, and they say it's open, but I couldn't find the source, and I haven't heard anything else about it. Um, it's a web-based thing, so you plug it into a network, and point your web browser to it, and you've got a 70 centimetre SDR, which you can do all sorts of fun stuff with. Um, there's these things, the SDR exciters, they're not really what I'd call amateur radio transceivers, but they do do what I said in the first slide. So they're, they're exciters because they're 100 milliwatts or less. They're very low power, kind of like the board we built today. Um, you really need to have filtering bef you know, for input and output on them and amplifiers to get any useful signal out of them. Now the Hack RF is pretty good. Uh, it's fully open. You can replicate it, and people have um, about 300 bucks worth of, of stuff in that. Uh, the yeah the UHF SDR from WB6DHW is mm, yeah it, it's kind of like the one we've built today, but for a higher band, a similar level of performance. Uh, the Blade RF 
it has various licenses for it. The boards and schematics are completely closed, you can't get them. Um, but all the FPGA code, the host software and the um, libraries to communicate with it are, are all open. And then there's the USRP, uh, which I forget what that stands for, but it's, it's a really high quality um, uh, yeah, it's a long time. SDR, yeah, that's been around for 15 years or so. And the newer versions are getting cheaper, they're down to sort of 600 bucks. But you, know, you can pay tens of thousands of dollars to these guys and they'll give you awesome things that are, you know, can sample all of HF at once at massive sample rates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Need, needs gigabit. Yeah. Or 10 gig, I think, for the, the really expensive stuff. So yeah, there's the soft rock, which is very similar idea to what we've got, uh, we've built today. In fact, it's the same mixing arrangement. Yeah, yeah the same, exactly the same idea. Different chips, and it also does transmit. Um, you, know, you feed it baseband IQ, and it it, it um, transmits that. But it's not quite open. It's a bit open, so you can get the schematics, uh, but not the layouts. Um, the control software was you know, win Windows-based stuff that someone has cloned, and there is an, an open. Uh, clone for that, but there's no source provided for the firmware, and you have to, you know, reverse engineer it or use their binary blob if that's what you want. And I think that was all I found. So there you go. There's my talk. Slides are available, and there are links for everything at the end. Uh, questions? <laughs> no. Excellent. No question. My question is, do you have a favourite one of the ones you've, you've shown us? Yeah, the portable SDR. That's my favourite. I want one. Do you have any of them? Uh, I have a Blade RF, um, but that's it. And I was going to build a, a soft rock, but then I thought, oh, I'll build an open radio. That's much better. Yeah. <laughs> so why that one? Why did you pick that one? Uh, well, because it's all open and the guy's actually built one. And I've seen it working. <laughs> is, that, is that an actual screen on the front? That is a TFT, um, um, oh, yeah, some sort of module, LCD thing, that plugs in uh, over the SCL um, bus. Bob? Well, the only ones you said um, had no PC required, are they USB or Ethernet or what, what's the interface? Oh, so the question? the question is uh, some of the early ones don't need a computer. Well, this one, it, does, it has a USB interface, but it's got all the ADC stuff uh, built in. So you, you don't need to do the ADC on your computer. What did you get out of it? Uh, audio. You get audio out of it. And so yeah, similarly with this one, you get audio out of that. Uh, these guys, um, you get um, yeah, baseband IQ at some sample rate. Yeah, lots for these ones. For the soft rock, you just get baseband IQ audio. And then you do your sampling and DSP stuff on the computer. Some of the some of them have the, the soundboard built into the into the box itself. Some of them use computer soundboards, is that right? Yeah, some do use a soundboard uh, on the computer and some have it built in. That's that's basically it. Uh, a soundboard though is not necessarily a PC sound card, it can be a, you know, a high, high sample rate SDR, uh, uh, ADC, sorry. And, and when you've got the high speed link, you know, like you give a link from 10 gig link to the box, what's going across that link? Uh, what's going across the 10 gig of 1 gig link for the USRP is uh, the sampled uh, IQ. So you get one sample of I, then Q, I, Q, 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 like that. So the, the ADC is in the, in the, the box. Device. Yeah. And the computer just gets the same. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, these little TV dongles are, are similar. Mm -hmm. You get two megabits a second of IQ data. And you've got to process that you know, with your, your DSP stuff, which I don't really understand, but I'm getting there. All right, that looks like it. Thank you very much. But I actually have a talk. Do we have 15 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Cool.
Take your lanyard off because that'll okay. usually rub against the mic. Sure. Okay, that's it. One, two. How's that? Oh, we'll wait. Just wait for them to give you yeah. the okay. One, two, is that good? Oh. <laughs> One, two, how's that? Sounding good? Great, okay. So I'm Paul Campbell. Um, I've been building open source hardware projects since the mid-90s. We didn't have a name for it back then. We didn't, my original stuff doesn't say open source because we didn't have a name. Um, these days I build decked hardware for household phones. And before that, I built cable set-top boxes. Um, I had a, I, this is a project I gave. I actually gave this talk at OSDC in Auckland last year. I apologise if you saw it before. Um, I'm going to speed through it because um, it's intended to be longer. Plus, there's a big section at the end labelled demo, and I didn't actually come with a demo. Um, so this is an open source project that I I did over the last couple of years. Um, basically. You know, we've got this whole Internet of Things, and we were all promised an Internet of Things, but, you know, where is it? You know, we don't know yet. It hasn't shown up. Um, it should be everywhere. There should, but to have the ubiquitous hardware that everyone can use, it has to be cheap and it needs to be programmable. And, frankly, it, we all want it to be hackable, don't we? You know, we want better play with it. We don't want to have some evil people just dropping things in our house. We want to be able to hack on them ourselves. So we came up with this new platform. It's tiny, it's cheap, it's open source, it's hardware and software. Um, and it's all free for you to play with. It runs on 802.15.4, which is what runs under Zigbee. It's just the Mac level of stuff. So it's small and cheap. It runs on a CPU that is so small it doesn't really have Zigbee. won't even fit inside it. So we just threw it away. Um, the circuit is really simple. It's a, a, a CC2533, which is a TI part. It needs a crystal, a resistor, and a handful of decoupling caps. And you can program it. It has, sadly, an 8051 inside, for those who know what that is. I apologize. But it's cheap. <laughs> it's cheap. Um, this basically is, you know, the board is that. It's a crystal and a, a, a QFN chip, which is hard to solder, but not impossible. You will learn how to solder surface mount today. There is one resistor to set, set, a, set some current. There are two caps there that stay empty. Um, two caps on the crystal and three decoupling caps. That's it. Um, you can connect a serial port to it, you can connect, it has a built-in serial port, it has built-in I2C, lots of GPIOs. Um, what you make it do is up to you. Um, so the CPU, basically it's an Apple II with RF. It's tiny, it's slow. It has a 32 megahertz, which is a bit fast for an Apple II, but it's an 8-bit CPU. It has the most abysmal architecture to program with you've ever seen. You'll throw your hands up. Um, there's 32K of flash, 4K of SRAM, you can do lots in that. You know, for those who are used to Python and crap like that, it's, you know, this is tiny. We have a C compiler and we have an assembler. There are 19 GPIOs, there are two U UARTs, an, an SPI, there are some timers, and there's some 2 gigahertz RF. And there's an AES unit, so you can do crypto. <laughs> So we have a tiny OS, and it's really, really tiny. It's 6K, because we've only got 32K RAM, right, of, of, of flash. Um, there are very, very few calls. I'm going to show you them all today. Um, as I said, few enough to put on half a dozen slides. Um, it has th tasks. It's a, there's a threading API with tiny tasklets. They're kind of like coroutines, because there's only one stack, and it's 256 bytes, and we don't really have room to do context switches, there's no MMU. Um, basically, all there is is a timer queue, and you schedule things. Um, and there are callbacks. So there are just two API calls to our task. There's queue a task, and how long to wait, and you can say zero if you want. 
Um, and you can, you can queue a task from an interrupt, so you can just say do it at the bottom, bottom half, just like you do in the, in the Linux kernel. And you can cancel a task off the queue. That's it. There's an application model. We split our code between the kernel and applications. And I'll explain why in a little bit, because it's kind of useful. Um, apps get events from the kernel, and they can call into the kernel. Um, events arrive synchronously from tasks. So you um, get your events, and they occur in task context rather than, a current, than an interrupt context. And apps have a single routine which, um, to which the events are sent, and they have to return when you're done. Um, the RF does um, just the base level Mac level stuff. You can send datagrams. There's 128 bytes, and about 100 of them are available. It's unreliable because they're datagrams and they get lost. So you, you're responsible for re sending them. Routing is up to you or, or to us if you want to use our very tacky broadcast routing protocol. But you get to play and experiment and do cool stuff. Um, and we do provide an optional next level packet format for people who want to do other more interesting stuff, especially crypto. Um, the API is very simple. Turn the receiver on, turn it off, set the channel. It runs in the 2 gig band, so it's also the, the um, 2.4 gig band, so it's running in the cracks between the Wi-Fi. Um, and you can set the output power to some level. I, we actually set it really low because we're building um, things for Burning Man where we want to have lots and lots of badges people are wearing that talk to each other, but only locally. So we actually want to get the power levels down. Um, there's an RF send, and incoming packets arrive as an event. And that's it. And when you send, you get to say, here's the, here's the, uh, the data you want to send, how long it is, what crypto key you want to use, or no crypto, and who you want to send it to, or just am I going to broadcast it to everyone. So that's all you get. We have built-in crypto. It's easy to use because we've done all the hard stuff already. It's AES-128. Bad crypto on packets means you never see them. They get dropped. That means lots of people can live on the same channel. And as long as you don't have the same crypto keys, you only see the packets that come from your devices. Um, everyone else could be talking away, and you can have packets colliding, and you just don't see them. They fall on the floor. Um, so crypto is not just about keeping secrets. Crypto sums, sums provide much better data integrity um, than the simple CSE sums that people use. And application-specific crypto key means, as I said, many, many different people can live on the same channel. Um, in our case, our hardware, our physical hardware, holds a cached key entry. And we have numbers for our keys internally. So we're not always passing around big keys. We're just saying, use key number three. And there, one of the event callbacks is the hardware saying, I need key number three. I just got a packet that, that was encrypted with it. Um, so the only API is set the key. And you get a, a callback that tells you what to do it. That's it. Um, the best, coolest part is we do software update over the air. This means that you can have 500 of these in the room. And if you want to change the software, you don't have to walk around the room and put the programmer on each 500, all 500. You just have to update one. And it will update all the rest. It's really cool. I get to sit in my laptop and type make push. And it compiles it up, and it pushes it out. One of them gets the update, and then they all start twinkling around. And one by one, they update from each other. Um, what we do is we basically, I think I have some explanation here. Our kernels are fixed. So we have 32K of flash. We use 8K of it for, the, for our kernel. And the remaining 24K is split into two apps. There's the current one and the next one. So we can do update to one while we're running another one. And if we get a bad update, we don't have to update. They're crypto sum, they're checksum. So if we get a bad one, we throw it away. We never run. We, we always run the one with the highest version that has a good checksum whenever we boot. Um, and apps are keyed by platform and type and version. So you can have five different versions of the same hardware t tasked to a particular application, and they'll only take updates for that particular application. So they won't accidentally get someone else's update. Um, everyone updates to a higher version. All the software update is cryptoed for two reasons. One of them is that we want to get really good integrity when we're doing a software update. We don't want to turn up, end up with a room full of bricks. And the other reason is we don't want someone to take over our stuff and throw their own code on it. Um, 
So when, they, when software update completes, you get three choices. You get to reboot, obviously. You can do a restart, which doesn't really reset the hardware in quite the same way. And there's a way to pass state from one up from one version of the software to the next one. So you can do a software update and have the thing not remember, oh sorry, remember what it was doing beforehand. Um, there's some very simple GPO access available. I hacked up some macros that have the same name as the Arduino pin, the Arduino macros for those who want to look at them, but you know, that's easy. Um, the development environment is we don't want to use TI's compiler because it, it's not theirs, it comes from a third party and it costs a large amount of money, thousands of dollars. There is a compiler called SDCC. Um, much of TI's code won't compile on it, but we've hacked it up so it does. We did all the hard work for you. Um, SDCC makes crap code, frankly. Um, but it's a C compiler, it gets you going, gets you doing stuff. Once you run out of room and, or you want it to be a bit faster, you nip in there and you, you tweak a few bits in assembler and get the stuff you want going faster. Um, we have a family of programmers we built for, the, for this part um, and a Qt based GUI to drive them that runs on a Linux and I believe has been compiled to run under Windows, but I haven't actually seen that. Um, I'm going to give a talk on Thursday on our um, random number generator that's based on the same hardware and uses the same programmer because everything's so anyway, um, so programmers are USB based, ours is tiny, um, I'll pass it around. Um, I'm also going to pass it, oh, I'll talk about this in a minute. This is the program we use, it actually is, this one is Atmel based. Um, I, for those who are building hardware, I love these little co the connectors here which are um, tag connect connectors. You just, you, the, the other end is, costs nothing because it's just three holes and some pads on, on your circuit board. Um, so the programmer is something simple and dumb. Um, I do not recommend people do the um, the uh, circuit board, no, the other end, the, the, the circuit board USB connector. Right. It was a fun experiment, but um, I'm, throw, I'm not doing any of those anymore. They're not good. I don't, don't try it. However, they're, they're tiny, you know, this is, this is uh, and, and this is all open source. That's a very crappy photo, but. Um, we also have some hardware that's basically a serial gateway. It's a set of firmware that runs on one of our developer, development boards. We're going to do this one soon, which is um, the same software running um, basically as a programmer and as a, we'll pass this one around, that's a programmer and a, a base station. Um, it lets you, basically lets you inject packets out into your, into your Internet of Things. It's your, and it runs, um, it uses an RPC to talk between the CC23 and the host over a serial port. This guy also ha can act as a, as a programmer and also can act as a serial, as a dumb serial board. Um, there's a C++ class host side. You can write your own stuff or you can just use the stuff we have for doing software update. It's all scriptable so you can just say send these packets, do these things, make a, a script and say hey we want to send some binary that does that and here's a key and here's what you should encrypt it. Uh, and there's support for software updates so you don't actually have to write a anything to do that. It's already been done. It's all on the web. You can all download it. Um, it kind of looks like this. We have um, our host CPU running Linux or whatever. We have a, an app running talking to the serial, out through a serial port to the, the device we have on the end. Um, now it's all in one board here, but we can use one of the, the, the other programmers with a, um, one of our, our current dev systems and then lots of other nodes that you can do software update to. Um, so, five minutes. Yep, I'm almost done. So uh, we have some, I have some real prop platforms. There's a development system that I talked about. I have some blinkies we're making for Burning Man, which are got two LEDs on them that will have lots of people. We'll pass them around. Um, we have a a, tra a management system for um, a local uh, eco sanctuary, and we're going to tag all their traps. So, and they're going to form a little network every, every once a day and report back on which ones have gone off so the volunteers don't have to walk the entire trap line. Um, this is our dev system. I'm going to go really fast through this. Um, this is our normal programming environment, which is a, a serial port and a, a programmer. Uh, talking to the dev system, that becomes a serial gateway, or you can use the little card you just saw. This is the blinky thing I just passed around, which is um, basically two LEDs 
um, and a battery um, that uh, the idea is everyone programs them up to program their, their, their group, their tribe, their camp's colours, but if you spend too many times with those guys down there, you'll start showing their colours. If you go off to a rave and some, where someone has a controller, they'll all, they'll all bounce up and down to the music, and uh, plus they'll route, so we'll be able to inject packets and colours into the entire world. Um, let me quick, um, I sort of talked about uh, Arakanui, the idea is they want to put traps all the way around the outside. And so we can form, we can form a network once a day and just get the data back. Um, they kind of look like this. Um, and there's all sorts of other things people are doing. Um, so I, as I said, I didn't have, bring the demo with me, so I'm done. Questions? So, so, so what's, what's the current consumption? Um, when they're idle, it's one microamp. Um, when they're transmitting, it's about, depends on the power, but it can be up to 60 milliamps. So it really does depend. It's a um, three volt supply. It actually, um, yeah, everything runs on three volts, basically. You have to do that yourself. You can. That's what we're doing. The only update, is that just for the application but not the kernel? That's right. So, so, the, question, so the question is, is the application, the software update over the air part just for the application and not the kernel? And the answer is yes. The order is the kernel part is fixed. Um, you only even need an application there to do software update for a blank form. The kernel has enough in that 6K to do that. Um, I'm curious about the dipole antenna on the board. Click um, the dipole antenna on the PCB antenna on your boards. Do you have yeah. any comments about the resources that are used to create that and how it performs? Um, we haven't done a lot of analysis that does about two blocks in the open air. If I hold them in the air and my son runs to the end of the <laughs> street. <laughs> <laughs> but it really does depend on where you are. Um, in the in the intersection, we're worried about the bush and things getting wet and those sorts of issues. Um, it was copied from somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Do it myself. Anyone else? In the eco-sanctuary, are you actually using a hop-by-hop -hop type method? Because we, it looks like quite a big area. We haven't actually deployed it yet because it's, I, I partly did this project to get some students involved so they get some stuff on the resumes from the uni and the student who's going to do that bit. Um, but we haven't actually deployed it yet. Um, but we can have a look at that one. Do you have a website that we can look Yes, I do. I sent you the... Yes, but you're around. Moon, <laughs> uh, moonbaseotago.com is the place to go. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, sorry guys, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, we have a hard time limit to be out of downstairs a workshop at 5.30. They lock up at 5.30. So uh, if you have gear downstairs, please go down, pack up and get out of there. Um, we've got a little bit of tidy up to do up here. Obviously, and I've got a few of you down there to pack up the stuff. So, um, thank you all for coming. Um, there will be more updates on the openradio.net.au site as we do more software and do more stuff. Obviously, during the week, um, we're going to be available to do more software stuff. If you haven't finished your build, we'll help you out. We'll get stuff happening. Um, there'll be more on the chat mailing list. Um, what else? There'll be more on the chat mailing list. I can't think of anything else at the moment. Thanks for coming and let's get moving so we can get out of here. I'm thinking that we should do is probably pack up and take them into the middle. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. All right, thank you.